especial y no cabe duda que Tijuana es la frontera inteligente que avanza rumbo a la grandeza. Y enseguida tengo el gusto de presentar la conferencia ¿Qué sigue en innovación y diseño? Nuestra conferencista es Natalie Jeremijenko, científica y artista. Jeremijenko es una artista que ha redefinido el concepto de la estética con propuestas creativas que inciden en la vida cotidiana de las personas y su manera de relacionarse con el medio ambiente. Natalie rompe esquemas y nos presenta nuevas opciones de convivencia a través del arte en nuestras vidas. Ella estudió bioquímica, física, neurociencia e ingeniería de precisión, ciencias que aplica en sus intervenciones artísticas. Sus proyectos son un verdadero reto y una provocación que hace un llamado por las acciones a favor de las comunidades. Por otro lado, sus obras se han exhibido en los museos más importantes del mundo, tales como el Smithsonian, el MAS, el MoMA y otros. Ha sido nombrada por ID Magazine como una de las diseñadoras de mayor influencia en el mundo. Natalie Yermijenko es directora de la Clínica de Salud Ambiental en la Universidad de Nueva York, ciudad donde actualmente radica. Realiza intervenciones urbanas en que sacuden la conciencia ecológica y embellecen a puntos neurálgicos de la traza urbana. Recibamos con mucho afecto a Natalie Yermijenko. Hello. <laughs> so it's just a great pleasure to be here. And I have to say, by way of introduction, I um, took a job at UCSD quite a few years ago. And my idea in accepting that job was that I would be able to live in Tijuana and commute up to and work in La Jolla. They've made that very difficult for me. But if I had to choose again, that's exactly what I would do, live in Tijuana and commute to. La Jolla. But what I'd actually like to do today is talk to you about the work I've been doing since I left UCSD, which has focused the opportunity for change that we all have, the opportunity presented to us by new technology, to address the social and environmental challenges we face in the 21st century. Yes. It's not? Okay. Okay. There we are. Okay. So, uh, what I've been uh, what I've been doing in order to address this particular opportunity is I set up my new lab in New York as the Environmental Health Clinic. I'd like to introduce you to this work. Uh, some recent exhibitions in order to address what we might call the crisis of agency. Um, so what um, my lab looks like now is an environmental health clinic. And I, uh, let me play you that animation one more time. It's actually a twist on health. My clinic redefines what is health. Health that is external and shared that's in the air quality in this room. Um, it <clears throat> functions like a health clinic, like any other university health clinic, but people who come to the clinic are not called patients. They're called impatients because they're too impatient to wait for legislative change to address environmental issues, right? So the, um, you come with environmental health concerns as opposed to medical health concerns, and you walk out with prescriptions not for pharmaceuticals, but for things that you can do to improve your local environmental health. So that's what the Environmental Health Clinic does, and I want to just motivate that with a couple of examples of other people who are trying to redefine what we, what we talk about as health and certainly what we talk about as the environment. So Philip Landrigan's work is one example where he looked at what pediatricians do in Manhattan when they see patients. 80% of their time is spent five top things. Number one, 
you can probably guess, asthma. Number two, development, uh, developmental delays like ADD, ADHD, autism spectrum. Um, number three is rare childhood cancers, a 400-fold increase in the last 15 years of rare childhood cancers, which take up an enormous amount of time. And five, four and five are what I call diabetes, juvenile diabetes and obesity epidemics. Those top five things, what do they have in common? The environment is implicated in each one of them. Right? This is not what medicos are trained to deal with. This is not the germ theory of health. And 80% of their time is dealing with this. So if we want to figure out how we might redefine health, I suggest the time is now. Um, I'm not suggesting we actually use our children as canaries, but um, I think they can tell us a thing or two. There's somebody else who can, we don't typically listen to that I think we could, and that's the non-humans we cohabitate with. Um, there's a wonderful statistician called David Allison who looked at this phenomenon. He looked at 38 species of animals that live with us, feral animals, lab animals, pets, dogs, coyote, rats, and looked for the obesity epidemic in the, all those 38 species to see if it was evident. He found it present in every single one of those species, which tells us it's not just about time on the Stairmaster, it's the environment. So I want to sort of turn to these non-humans to see what they can teach us. This is a project called, um, sorry, there's a project called Perch. Ah, that's exactly what I need. Which is communication technologies for birds. So a bird will land on this perch and trigger a sound file that'll say something like this. Now here's what you need to do. Go down there. Let me try that again, just so it needs to be a little louder. Okay. Now here's what you need to do. Go down there and buy some of those health food bars, the ones you call bird food, and bring it here and scatter it around. There's a good person. Okay. Um, so just, sorry. So these perches were actually, um, in the places I've set them up in, they have each have a different argument. One argument, my favorite, was you know, the birds trying to convince us that, they, that copyright dues were due for the melodic resources and the cell phone ringtones that we'd borrowed from them. But um, the birds, you know, they were experimenting with people, landing on which one to see which worked best. And about eight to one, they decided that it was this argument that was the most effective in eliciting cooperative behavior from the people below. Tick, tick. That's the sound of genetic mutations, of the avian flu becoming a deadly human flu. Do you know what slows it down? Healthy subpopulations of birds, increasing biodiversity generally. It is in your interests that I am healthy, happy, well-fed. Hence, you could share some of your nutritional resources instead of monopolizing them. That is, share your lunch. Okay, so that's some biology 101 from our non-human friends. That um, here's some other non-humans I suggest we could listen to. This is a um, project called Amphibious Architecture, and it's a series of buoys that, when fish swim underneath, they light up the buoys. Right? It's very simple. Here it is. We we installed it in the East River in New York City, and in the Bronx River. Here it is at night, and here it is. Um, you can see, actually, as we installed it, there's two, two layers of lights. There's a top always-on light that shifts from a warm red color when dissolved oxygen or water quality is low to a cool green-blue color when um, dissolved oxygen is high. And uh, then, of course, the bottom layer of lights that light up as the fish go under, a sort of a low-resolution display of fish presence. So the first question that people asked was, are there fish in the East River? So let's see, I think you can see here that, oh, across the front, there's, there's a fish going across down the side. Yes, there are fish in the East River. So not only can you see that there's fish there, but you can also text those fish, um, and they text you back. So actually down on the site, there was business cards for all the organisms that were likely to be there with their contact details. So you could text them, and they texted you back. By far the most popular was the beaver, 
Yo Beaver was his contact details. He had 700 people subscribing to daily and weekly updates. He was a bit of a sleazy character. He was, a, he, was, he was the first beaver to move into New York City in over 200 years. And like two million other desperate single males, he was always asking people to come over for a cross-species adventure or to visit his lodge. But um, there they are in the Bronx River. Um, but the other thing was um, what happens when animals are there is that uh, there's always a sign, do not feed the animals. And you've got to ask. Why not feed the animals? Why should we monopolize all the nutritional resources? And um, so you can imagine a busload full of kids pulling up to these, these uh, amphibious architecture array, the buoys, and feeding them you know, Doritos or chewing gum or the cigarette butts. Um, and that's why, of course, zoos have do not feed the animals. I mean, I suppose the, the received wisdom is human food is good, for hum good enough for humans, but not really good enough for animals. Um, but uh, the other idea is that if we feed the animals, we'll interfere with them. We might make them dependent on us, which I think is the craziest idea, given that when we drive along the freeway to visit a national park, we don't think about interfering, interfering with the animals. You know, we're cutting off their mi migration route, we're limiting their nutritional resources. In fact, we're changing the entire global climate. Yes, we're interfering with the animals. And I think our interactions with them need not be negative. They could be positive. So we developed some lures, which are uh, a gelin-based, that's an algae derivative, a nutritionally appropriate food that, that can be offered to the fish. Um, in addition, it has a chelating agent, so that if, you're, um, if you were, had mercury poisoning, you'd be given this medical-grade chelating agent. So as the fish ingest it, it, thank you, it, um, binds to the bioaccumulated heavy metals, the PCBs and the mercury in the fish's body, passes out in a complex form where it's less reactive and settles down into the silt where it's effectively removed from bioavailability. Right? So uh, the collective effect of many people, many individual interactions feeding the fish, of course, the desire to feed those fish or other animals is only as ubiquitous as that sign, do not feed the animals. We all like to do this. That, the, that simple offering can amount to a collective action, a significant environmental remediative action to not only augment the nutritional resources available to our non-human neighbors, but also a targeted drug delivery approach to removing the, or addressing the health of the fish. The major source of mercury in your body is from the fish. By treating the fish's health, we're treating our own. So this is an example of how these individual interactions can aggregate to something significant um, towards a fish restaurant. Of course, the lures are just like commercial fishing lures. The hook is, there is no hook. Um, OK, this has actually launched a whole series of projects called the Cross Species Adventure Club, which is food and food systems that actually not only, um, not only reduce the negative damage, reduce the food miles, reduce the pesticides or petrochemical fertilizers, but actually develops food and food systems that can improve environmental health, augment biodiversity, and be delicious. So um, many of these uh, delicious foods, let me just show you. Well, here's one. Just the invitation, the way I've been doing this is through a supper club, which, a molecular gastronomy supper club. And frankly, they're illegal. So um, when you get an invitation to come to the Cross Species Adventure Club, we ask you to read that invitation and then scan that invitation and then eat that invitation, right? To explore how we might use more ephemeral materials for the ephemeral purposes of an um, invitation. Why use durable materials that will last 15 years in a landfill? Um, there's many other delicious foods, but I'd like to skip on to the complex, the irreducible complexity of our urban ecosystems. How do we promote biodiversity and increase the environmental health for all of us? Improving environmental health means improving human health. Um, so I'd like to show you a couple of infrastructures, 
we've developed recently called, one is called the Butterfly Bridge. Very important in an area like this where you have butterfly traffic jams here in, uh, nowhere else in the world has this. Um, but this is a butterfly bridge, a very simple uh, bridge that spans from one habitat patch to another. Urban biodiversity, you're probably not surprised to learn Urban centers are actually islands of biodiversity. Everyone brings in their favorite tree from home. There, uh, in metropolitan Paris, they did a study to look at um, butterflies and moths, and they compared, this was the biggest citizen science um, study that run by the UNDP. They compared metropolitan Paris to the surrounding rural areas. They found that the biodiversity within metropolitan Paris was more than seven times in species number and biodiversity than the surrounding rural agricultural area. Urban centers are islands of biodiversity, but they, uh, they're fragmented patches of habitat that need to be connected. So this is a butterfly bridge, planted with butterfly attracting plants. The butterflies bounce from plant to plant, so they don't end up as smeared on your windscreen. And um, the genetic flow, that uh, increases the viability of populations on either side in every patch um, is increased. Um, uh, so another example of this is the Salamander Superhighway, which is a very, um, a, a micro speed bump, if you will. I think I have a picture of it. That, um, I thought I had a better picture of it. I do somewhere. Um, a micro speed bump uh, that as the uh, vehicle, uh, the inhabitants in a vehicle of, above goes over it, it sort of reminds us that we're not alone. So it, um, uh, it provides safe passage for salamanders, like the wonderful tiger salamander that you have here, to go from one, actually in New Jersey there's a, a wonderful couple, um, husband and wife team, who go out in salamander season with buckets and all their friends, and they put the salamanders into the bucket, and then they run across the road, and they tip them out again, and they do that. Um, this is an, an upgrade of that. Um, but there's a passive infrared sensor, so as the salamanders go through, it'll tweet interested parties. Hi, honey, I'm heading home. Or as we set it up in, um, so, uh, in Socrates Sculpture Park, a Socratic salamander asked important questions like, what comes first, the migration route or the salamander? Um, simple, uh, this was actually all part of a, um, this simple inexpensive infrastructure alteration was part of the Civic Action Exhibition, um, which was, I was one of several artists invited to develop urban plans for Long Island City, which is an interesting chunk of New York City where there's manufacturing, dense residential, commercial uses, and um, a tremendous pressure, not unlike Tijuana, to reimagine what is possible, to improve environmental health for all of us. Um, one of the projects in that was to take the interest that we all have in looking good. And so at the Environmental Health Clinic, we were developing exercise programs, personal training programs for individuals and small groups to improve their environmental health, build up their deltoids and their six packs. And uh, in addition to, increasing environmental health. So each person got a, an exercise route. This is Long Island City. And exercises were um, things like, in one spot here, the hula hooping, which is great core body conditioning for those six pack. Our hula hoops are adapted, so the northeastern wildflower seeds are inside them. And as you hula hoop, you're spreading perennial resources for critical pollinators in the, uh, in the area. Um, and uh, you know, you're much more likely to come back next Saturday to do your jogging route because you want to see what's happened. You want to see the effect you've had. Again, small actions can aggregate to significant environmental effect. Um, and uh, this, I term this sort of, uh, many of these non-human projects, kind of a revision of zoos, the Bronx ooze um, and beyond is, um, the with zoo, ooze is zoo backwards and without cages. We don't have to incarcerate animals. We can reimagine how to interact with them in productive and interesting, spectacular ways. Um, and in fact, this is one of the new sports that I thought might be interesting to Tijuana 
residents. Um, does anybody know who this is? The strongest animal in the world? Many people think it's the ant. It's actually um, the rhinoceros beetle, stag beetle. Um, and interfacing with these under-celebrated heroes of the underworld has been a little difficult. Um, so I've been working on this problem, um, how to interact with these beetles in uh, developing an interface to do that, and came up with a rhinoceros beetle wrestler. This is a wrestling mask, if you will, um, that is, uh, enables, it scales down human forces to uh, rhinoceros beetle scale and scales up rhinoceros beetle forces to human scale to give you a level playing field. Do you know how strong these guys are? They are the caterpillars of the underworld. They, uh, that is the, the um, yellow heavy lifting machinery, right? They churn the rhizomic sphere, aerating the soil, producing incredible biodiversity. They're critical organisms. Um, they, uh, they're uh, marvelous. And of course, you can, man versus beast, you can take, uh, the fundraising strategy for this is taking bets on, on uh, anyone interested. Um, heroes of masculinity want to take on the rhinoceros beetle. This is how you uh, do it. Uh, of course, the mechanical power and the visual power allows you to intimately interact with these um, tremendous creatures. And the odds are not with the um, uh, humans, They're actually with the um, non-humans. But of course, there's demonstration of tremendous strength. You can imagine if every uh, high school had a rhinoceros beetle wrestling team, right? And I offer rhinoceros beetle wrestling scholarships in my um, university lab, anyone who uh, is a great rhinoceros beetle wrestler can come and work with me any time. But you can imagine if they all, if we actually promoted and integrated their existence into our, into our lifestyles, we'd get somewhere. Uh, we'd get, certainly, tremendous soil biodiversity. I want to introduce you to one other project called the Tree Office, um, which is a tree office, of course. Um, it is in a canopy of a tree, um, and a part of the uh, civic action exhibition, I decided that trees would own themselves and the property they stood on. Right, this is actually, there's a legal precedence in, um, in Athens, Georgia, there, uh, in 1848. A, an old guy said to his tree that he was going to will it uh, to itself. Um, it was his idea to do this. Unfortunately, that tree died, and about 50 years later, the Ladies' Gardening Club replanted an acorn from that tree on the same site. So they tested heritability laws, and the tree that owns itself is a tourist attraction in Athens, Georgia, that you can visit. The trees now in Long Island City also own themselves, and this is consistent with the Bolivian rights of Earth discourse, extending human rights to non-human organisms. What would that mean? And that's what we were exploring, because it's a nice idea, but to actually be able to exploit your property is what we're most interested in. Right, so we built a tree office. We also did um, some yoga classes underneath the tree. Has anybody done aerial yoga, anti-gravity yoga? You pay your yoga fees to the tree, of course, because that's your landlord. Same with co-working space. It has high-speed internet, locally produced power, stretching views of Manhattan in this particular park, and people it was the best office over summer in all of New York City. Um, and of course, you paid your dues to the fee, uh, your fees to, the, um, to your landlord, to the tree. And what does the tree do with that? He invested in his own interests, right? Putting biochar augmentation in the soil, um, uh, companion planting, and we had a scheme to send its offspring off to college. So people who worked in the office a couple of Cornell students, an NYU student, a Rutgers student, they took their saplings and planted them in college campuses since we did this exhibition. So, of course, investing in them, generating revenue for these non-human organisms means investing in their own self-interest, which goes beyond the janitorial imagination of parks departments um, around the country. Um, the tree office, 
We're setting another one up in the Bronx in New York, so anyone visiting to uh, New York interested in the uh, office, you're welcome to come and work here. Um, it was very popular. Moth Cinema was another project in this area, which was actually uh, taking, it was a silver screen that hang, hung in the, um, in the park, and a, a moth garden that provided pollination and nectar plants. The light illuminated the screen, and every night, just after sunset, the nightly dramas, the love triangles, the adventures, the mysteries of our nightly companions were played out on the large screen. Um, it was a beautiful attraction. We actually had the first lunar moth in 40 years to be observed in um, New York City. Uh, spent uh, his entire lifetime. There was, we think there was four different um, lunar moths there. We're not sure, they all look the same. Um, let me show you another project that um, is called Pharmacy. Again, you're starting to see small actions that recognize these non-human, um, critical non-humans who have a lot to offer. Of course, the moths are critical pollinators. Um, but we're poised at the moment. I think what we could rightly call the space race of the 21st century is how to reinvent our food and food systems. This is an urgent task that we're all looking to understand. And in this uh, project, that's what we're exploring. Pharmacy, as it's spelt in English, you have to, you know, it's usually spelt PH, so it suggests farm, but also to improve health. It doesn't work so well in Spanish, I have to say. Um, so forgive me. And um, this, uh, the pharmacy is, uh, the charge of the pharmacy is to develop urban agriculture that improves environmental health, right? Not just produces delicious edibles. Um, to demonstrate that it can be done, it's based on this very inexpensive Tyvek, a common building material that is not only has high, extraordinary high tensile strength, but is waterproof and breathes. So this gives us the capacity to turn any railing or uh, parapet or windowsill, thin air, into arable territory. So. It's a closed system agriculture. For those of you who garden, how does it drain? It has a, a polymer, a polyacrylamide gel that's similar to what you have in diapers or in your um, contact lenses that actually uh, absorbs the water and expands to about 400 times its size until the osmotic pressure is high enough, until the soil is dry enough, and then it releases it back in. So we have a closed system, extremely um, water conservative, uh, and very simple, low maintenance uh, ag urban agriculture system. Now, the interesting thing about this is what to grow. One of the big criticisms of urban agriculture is why? Why not just invest in the rural agricultural communities, right? In the case of New York City, seven miles up the Hudson, family farms are selling out their farms to fracking because farming is not, um, it's so difficult. So you don't want to compete with this. So we have to develop ways that, well, we have to develop foods and edibles that uh, don't compete. So not growing the same things, but new things. Uh, in this case, what do you think is the best things to grow in an urban context? Has anybody considered this? I'll give you the answer. <laughs> high nutrition value, high commercial value, highly perishable non-distributable goods. And in fact, what we want is to plants with a high shoot to root ratio, a lot of leaf area, because leaf area, leaf area index as we call it, is the only technology we have for improving environmental health, for improving air quality, right? It's the only demonstrated technology we have for doing that. And it's inexpensive and we can, can uh, produce it very easily. So this gives us a palette of berries and edible flowers, right? The high color, High commercial value, highly perishable. I know you probably don't eat many flowers, but um, you're going to learn. Let me tell you, black pansies, if you pick the black pansies there and don't use them within a couple of minutes, all those delicate, incredibly luscious, uh, volatiles just disappear. But if you flash infuse them into, into vodka, they become the most delicious. Black pansy vodka. These explorations in new foods 
uh, I think is, is important, hence the Cross Species Adventure Club, for adventurous eaters, right? Um, this was a, a, a installation, I'll um, just tell you that uh, this particular facade we installed um, uh, had about 78, uh, with, with the berries grown, had about 78 street trees worth of leaf area index, and it's produced every year, right? This leaf area is only there um, <clears throat> when, in, uh, when there's leaf area. So 78 street trees worth of um, leaf uh, air cleaning there. Unfortunately, this got me a class one violation from the Department of Buildings, which is exactly what they give to you know, construction companies that kill people with cranes, right? This, and I went to court and it was very amusing um, uh, you know, explaining to them what it was, and the judge was very interested and wanted one for her, um, for her deck. Um, but then uh, I had this terrible charge because I didn't have the right permit. And I asked her, well, what permit would I use? And there isn't a permit for doing urban agriculture, right? Uh, so we figured out that maybe the best way to do it is to pretend that these are actually advertising, that these are banners. So anybody who wants to do this now, um, you'd get a permit for advertising. We have to figure out what we're advertising, but f part of the job of hacking our food systems with our tongues is exploring both technically feasible but bureaucratically uh, feasible um, uh, projects to start to explore what might be possible. This is one of the urban farmers, uh, Doni. Um, she had never farmed before, and she's now producing black pansy vodka, amongst other things. Um, and uh, there's a tremendous amount of small-scale coordination that we can achieve to really increase the leaf area index, that is, improve the air quality for each of us, augment the biodiversity. Of course, the edible flowers are not just good for us. All those pollinators like them too. Um, and uh, improving environmental health in addition to producing delicious edibles. This was a vertical plot we did in Socrates Sculpture Park as part of the Civic Action Exhibition to explore how we might take these lifeless structures and reintegrate them. I'm gonna finish with a, a couple of projects on perhaps the most difficult area for each one of us. I mentioned before the crisis of agency, and what I mean by that is what to do, right? What does each one of us as individuals do in the face of tremendously complex and daunting environmental and social challenges. Can we do anything institutionally, individually, collectively? What can we do? Primarily, this is what the Environmental Health Clinic is set up to do, to figure out what each one of us can do, not as a simple set of answers, but with the limitations of our own resources and capacities. I believe we can with imagination and the tremendous interest of many people that I've worked with produce a desirable future. Um, but perhaps transportation is the most difficult area where we feel locked in to existing infrastructure. Um, so I'll show you a couple of projects in this area. Uh, this is the bike messenger we just developed. It's a point of view display that's worn on, on um, bicycle wheels. Um, this is a geolocated real-time media, uh, so that the first indicator we released on this POV display is actually, this is very much in, in prototype form, uh, is the very simple strategy of as you go through a particular intersection, that intersection, you'll sh display on your wheels the fatalities at that intersection, and uh, again at the next one. So there's all many other um, indicators uh, exploring with this, but of course this makes the cyclist more visible and explores the pleasure and fun of uh, emissionless um, transportation. This is um, the How Stuff is Made project, which is a collective project that I do in collaboration with every um, inpatient and student that I work with, where we take, well here's a diagnostic. Um, does anybody have anything on them or with them or that they use every day? that they know how it was made and who made it. Does anybody have anything here?
I'm guessing no, and it's, I mean, you know, this, this is usually, the answer is nothing, unless it's a hand-knitted scarf by one's grandmother. You have something? A mug? A mug that you carry with you and use a lot? And you know who made it and how it was made, but? Great. Great, so we have one thing, which is great. That's more than usual. <laughs> the idea is that we live with this profound ignorance of how things are made. So how can we figure out how to change them? The How Stuff is Made and How It Can Change website is an encyclopedia co-produced with students and impatients that takes a contemporary good and documents how it was made, documenting the labor conditions, the environmental impacts, and the manufacturing innovations. Right? Because I can tell you if the students, if all of us aren't imagining how we can improve and change the most deadly, the most toxic of all our global human activities,